Hello and welcome to Try Talking Sport, hosted by me, Joanne Murphy. Whether you are an athlete, adventurer, endurance enthusiast, or simply have an interest in sport, you've come to the right place for inspiration, encouragement, motivation, and a little bit of entertainment. In the past few weeks, the world seems to have started turning again with lots of normal activities and things we took for granted pre-COVID returning. Being able to meet up with friends and family and move outside a 5K radius has been a huge boost and certainly brightened up even the most miserable of days. I've loved being able to get out on the open road on the bike and really enjoyed some consistency in training. The good weather has also helped greatly. I was delighted to be on two shows last week, the Road to Tenby podcast with Tom Davies and the Aid Station show with Chris Robb. In preparing for both of these interviews, I realised how much I miss people and my role as an announcer. It's only when you take a step back to reflect that you realise what you are missing and how much the little things can mean so much. Never did I think I'd be longing for the return to a finish line with the wind howling and the rain streaming, athletes coming across the line all ready for high fives and sweaty hugs. Okay, I'd leave the wind and rain behind, but the hugs and high fives were part and parcel of life as an announcer and I do miss it and the community of people I got to work with and to meet every weekend at races all over the country. But racing will return. Despite more races getting shelved in recent days, there is a glimmer of hope in every day as the return to racing and training plans get put into place and rolled out across the world. Hopefully it won't be too long before there is a microphone in my hand, the tunes are pumping and the athletes are racing, chasing goals and fulfilling dreams. If all else fails, I'll just set up a speaker on the promenade in Galway and announce everyone as they run, walk, jog or cycle through Salt Hill. Now there's an idea. Hmm. Okay, all joking aside, and if you are in need of some inspiration, tune in to the Ironman Ireland Facebook page this Friday night at 8pm for a live panel discussion with some really great, inspiring female athletes. Of course, we should be in Cork this weekend for Ironman Ireland, but instead of being there to see lots of stories unfold on race day, we are bringing you some inspirational stories online. So don't forget to tune in. Now to today's episode of the podcast with Irish cyclist Imogen Cotter from County Clare, who, when not in lockdown, lives in Belgium with her boyfriend and is pursuing a career and a dream of becoming a professional cyclist. The 26-year-old has always been interested in sport, having enjoyed success as a triathlete and runner before turning her attention to cycling. She was part of the Cycling Ireland National Track Programme for 18 months, moving to Mallorca for a period to train with the team and try her hand at team pursuit. At the end of 2018, she decided to switch to road cycling, moving to Belgium to pursue her sporting goals. Coming second in the Elite National Road Championships in 2019 was a highlight of her career to date and when racing resumes in Belgium later this year she will continue her quest to become the best at her chosen sport and earn a place on a UCI team. We get an insight into her life during COVID-19 at home in County Clare, some tips on taking the fear out of bike racing in a bunch and why she simply loves to train and loves racing. Enjoy the episode, we had lots of fun recording it, and there are plenty of belly laughs to enjoy along the way. Imogen, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It's a beautiful, bright Monday morning in Galway. Uh, you've been in Clare since uh, St. Patrick's Day. Well, yeah, I came back to Ireland uh, on St. Patrick's Day for, I was just hoping to visit for a couple of weeks because my mum and my sister, obviously the schools have been shut down. So I was thinking, oh, great, I'll see them for a couple of weeks before my racing season kicks off. And then that was three months ago tomorrow. So I, was, I had my stay extended and I've actually loved it. Like it's been so nice to be back home at this time because I'm usually so busy at this time of year. It would be like full on just racing all the time. So it's nice to be able to be at home, be able to train, but also just be able to chill and spend time with family. Tell us a little bit about your life since moving to Belgium. How have things changed? Well, I suppose before I was in Belgium, I was really focused uh, because I'm, I was doing cycling on the track and I was really focused on that. I actually then moved to Belgium and I had left the Cycling Ireland track program then. And I suppose I just really started to enjoy riding my bike just for how I wanted to ride it. Because when I had been with the Cycling Ireland track program, you know, every day had a purpose and it was just quite like it's obviously if you're on a national program, it's going to be high pressure and it's going to be a lot of, you know, really targeted focus every day so actually when I moved to Belgium I was just able to enjoy riding my bike as I wanted to 
Um, so that was really lovely. And obviously then I've changed going from the track to the road has been a big difference as well. My training totally changed around. So, but it kind of changed to something that suited me more. So yeah, Belgium has been a lot of changes, but I love it there. I'm going to come right back now and talk about your, um, I suppose, career in sport and your background in sport from a youngster because you were in athletics uh, before you were in cycling. So talk us through your journey in sport from from being, um, I suppose, a younger athlete. Uh, you're what now, 20, 26 years of age now? 26, yeah. As a kid, I was always kind of doing running and swimming. So that was, they were kind of my two main sports. And then when I was about 15 or 16, my dad had taken up cycling and he just said like, oh, well, look, if you do cycling, then, you know, you can do a triathlon. But I hadn't even thought of that. It never even entered my head. So when I was about 16, 17, I started doing triathlons and I loved them. I was, I, I think I was pretty good at them, but I had a lot of bad luck in them. Like things would always go wrong. Like I was, I don't know, like one time I was doing really well. I was like the lead junior and I pulled off the tag when I was taking off my wetsuit and my, you know, things like that. My my uh, result wasn't counted. Um, so I think then I went from doing the triathlons to focusing just on running. And then from about 18 up until 23, I was just focusing on running and I was kind of doing a lot of, I did stuff on the track but I also did 10ks on the road and uh, cross country was my favorite I loved that and then the Cycling Ireland talent transfer program was kicking off in 2017 and I just decided to give it a shot and to see where I could get and I got through to the to the last four so then I was on the um, talent transfer program which meant I was focusing on cycling on the track and doing the team pursuit and so I ended up moving out to Mallorca with the Cycling Ireland team to focus on that training for a year. That was in 2018. And then at the end of 2018, then I moved to Belgium. So that's a really condensed version of it. It's a it's very quick succession, isn't it, really, from the first time you were kind of running and swimming to the bike to now, for want of a better word, living in Belgium and, I suppose, pursuing your passion for sport. Yeah, well, I, I've always been really focus on sport it's always come first for me which is not really that can be good but it can be bad as well like when I was in university and I was obviously running like I would be just like oh yeah lectures but I'll get my running done like that was the main thing um so yeah it's good and bad but I've always had like a really focus like just determination when it comes to sport in terms of being in Mallorca, you were with the Cycling Ireland um, team at, at that time. Um, so what was that like? What was the environment like out there? I presume it was a lot of track stuff you were doing with them specifically, as opposed to the bunch racing and the outdoor racing that we would see over here primarily in Ireland. Yeah, so we were in the Team Pursuit kind of setup. That's what we were being trained for. Team Pursuit is four riders in a line just trying to get around the track to cover 4K as fast as you can. I mean, like anything that's very timed and specific, even when you're doing running work on the track, it was very down to the millisecond. You know, it was really, if you were a millisecond slower than someone or something like that, it could ruin your whole day. Which when you think about it now, now that I'm outside of that, I'm like, wow, a millisecond. But at the time, I remember thinking like, oh my God, I was 0.2 of a second slower, like I'm the worst. You know, it was. it's a really bizarre um it's really bizarre when you're in that pressure, that high pressure environment. Um, and yeah, I did. I found that really hard. It just wasn't something I was ever very good at. It was kind of pushing myself out of my comfort zone because team pursuit as well. I come from an endurance background. Team pursuit is quite high power, explosive for four minutes. Um, so I found that hard. Yeah. But it was amazing. Obviously, it was kind of the opportunity of a lifetime to be able to say that, yeah, I, I was full time focus on something for a year it was incredible and then moving to Belgium you're you're on your own even though you're with the team uh, it's probably not as intense as as that team pursuit aspect because it's more road cycling and yes you have the support of a team but maybe not as intense yeah I would say that I mean I think the thing is that in team pursuit you can't have room for any errors so like if you are if you put out 50 watts less on the start line you could ruin the whole race Whereas there's so much room for kind of making a mistake and coming back from it in a road race. Like it's two and a half hours or three hours long, the typical race in Belgium. So if you 
are off the start line bad or I don't know there's just always room to make a mistake and come back from it and I prefer kind of that it's just a lot more fun for me anyway because you can kind of you can see how things will happen and the race is never decided something could change massively in the last lap and then all of a sudden the person that you thought would lose will win or something like that like I feel like it's just more exciting. It's over a longer distance as well. So there is more room for mistakes, but there's also more room for breakaways. And, and I suppose there's no breakaways really in, in team pursuit when yeah. you're when you're tight together. You need to stay together. Yeah. But at least you can be leading the race and making a break and having everybody chase you or you can be chasing others. So there is that kind of competitive uh, as well, individually, as opposed to as part of a team. Yeah, it, absolutely. Like if there is a breakaway in a team pursuit, something's going to be wrong. <laughs> So like but on the road it's like it's really fun to to be able to just I love it like the thrill of chasing and seeing who's going who's coming like what's going to happen each lap it's yeah it's fun in, in in cycling um do you ever get afraid of the bunch riding because I know myself I would much prefer to do a time trial than to go out in a bunch filled with women or men that there's just so much jostling and you're always afraid somebody's going to make a decision in front of you that's going to see you come off your bike you know so the bunch racing how do you get over the fear or were you ever afraid of of being in a bunch like that and coming off the bike that was something I really struggled with actually and I suppose I kind of went from zero to a hundred because I was used to just riding in a line with four people I'd never done bunch skills or bunch riding and then I went to Belgium and you're kind of thrown in with elite athletes who've been doing it since they're eight. They don't have any fear. They're like up against each other, like super compact. And the first time I was there, I remember just being like off the back, like as in I was just so far off the back that I wasn't getting any drafting from the bunch. I was just riding 90K by myself, basically. And that was like, it was really hard to push past that fear. But I think the more you do it and the more you work on that fear and, and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, uh, then the, the faster you learn. And, and now, yeah, I'm still afraid in a bunch, but I'm not like I'm not like I used to be. So sometimes if it comes into my head, oh, my God, if that girl's wheel does this, then I can come off there and hit my face and break my leg or something. Then I start to think that's when it it becomes a mind game but if you allow your head to go there it will kind of ruin it but I just don't allow my head to go there. So do you have any tips or tricks for people that they can use to help stave off that fear that they might have going to the start line of a race or when you're mid-race and you're in the middle of a pack or even on a sportif because there are well there were before Covid you could have like 50 or 60 people in a pack Uh, I don't know what's going to happen now when we go back to racing and to um, to sportifs in the future but you know that that kind of nervousness or how do you overcome it is there any tips or tricks that you would have that you would utilize to help you on the on the day well something that I started to do to just a baby step was I would begin by going at the outside so even now like being in the middle of a bunch with people behind me in front of me on either side of me that would still give me anxiety but actually if you just start moving up at the sides of the bunch then I mean it's not as scary and it's also then you get to the front and then you're like, oh, I'm at the front. Hey, I could do something here. You know, it's way easier to get to the front by moving up the sides. Um, that kind of changed it for me. And it changed my experience because once I started to think, oh, here's what I can do and here's where I can move up. Then I wasn't like just the scared person at the back anymore. I was, you know, I was like, oh, I'm at the front. Hey, I might just attack here or, you know, just giving something a shot. Um So and I suppose then a lot of it does come with just telling yourself, I'm I'm not scared, like not letting it come into your mind. So as soon as it comes into your mind, I start to tell myself, like, this will ruin my whole race. If I start to think I'm going to come off, I'm going to crash. So I just don't allow it. I'm just like, nope, not thinking about it, not thinking about it. And actually, the worst crashes that I have had have been crash slow crashes. That's a slow crash is when you hurt yourself badly, like break something a lot of the time you know usually with a with the fast crash you just break like you just lose some skin but with slow crash, you say it so casually something. you just lose some skin <laughs> 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 well I mean I'm a bit of a cry baby so I probably wouldn't be so casual if it happened to me <laughs> it's true like I've had I've had like my worst crashes have been going really slow 
like my first crash that I ever had, I was going out my, my front gate and I was just clipped in, just about to go over my cattle grid. And I just came off and hit my face off the wall. Like that was my first ever crash. So I've never, I've actually been lucky enough, God touch wood. I've actually never had a crash in a race. I don't think. You were injured last year before um, a race. Had you done some damage to your sternum that saw you out of a yes. race last year? So, so what happened there? Yeah. Well, last year I, I damaged, I fractured my sternum and I also broke my radius. Um, so when I fractured my sternum, I was doing a, with Skoda, I was in France doing their ATAP de Tour. And I was cycling along in a group of like, there were four men in front of me and the men in front of me moved out of the way without saying anything. But there was like a, a kind of a divider in the middle of the road. There was kind of logs on top of each other. And I just cycled literally straight into it. Uh, went over my handlebars and I just came down really hard on my chest um, and I had a bit of pain but I was able to finish the I had like 120 or 30k left to do I was able to finish it but then at the end like my breathing I wasn't able to take a big breath and then when I went to the paramedics they were like mm, we think this is fractured <laughs> I was like, bloody hell. <laughs> you must have a huge pain threshold if you were able to yeah. cycle with a fractured sternum. I actually don't. I don't know. How, I think it must have just been adrenaline or something. I don't know how I how I finished it. But then anyway, it, I, I had a month off after that. And then I went back to do my first races um, once that was fully healed. So I had two races done. And in my third race back, I crashed before the start line. And I came down on my hand and like you know it's a rookie mistake you put your hand out right in front of you and it kind of just takes all of the all of the force and I just fractured my sternum or not my sternum my radius um so yeah that was my third race back and so then I suppose last year I had a great first half of my season I was really happy with that and I felt really strong and everything and then I just yeah the latter half of my season I kind of didn't have a latter half really. Tell me about your setup in Belgium in terms of of a team because you're pursuing cycling as a profession but you're not a professional cyclist is that the yeah, easiest so way to describe it? Moved, <laughs> yeah so I'm I'm riding uh, full-time I do coaching to fund myself and I have like a few little jobs that I do here and there that you know I have some income from but yeah I I'm not a professional cyclist, so I aim to be. That is a real dream of mine that at some stage I will be paid to ride my bike. But um, I know that I'm really at the beginning of my journey and it it will take a long time to get there. So at the moment, my team in Belgium is a club level team. So I've only kind of just begun. So my aim for next year, I don't know if it will happen now because I haven't had any races this year and I don't know how many races there will be. But my aim for next year was to go to a UCI team. I hope that even though there haven't been any races this year, I'm not really sure, you know, how, how they will be able to bring people into UCI teams if there hasn't been any results. But uh, my aim was originally to go to a UCI team next year. Now I might have to push that out by another year. But then I just one day hope to be paid to ride my bike. But I'm quite happy at the moment anyway. I actually love, I, I started doing the coaching in the last couple of months and it's something I've always loved. I, I studied uh, sports science in university. So I also love having this job to do on the side. So, so you're, nice. get, you're getting the best of both worlds really because you're pursuing your passion for sport in so many different ways. Yeah, exactly. And I've always loved to help people who might be at the beginning of it, of their fitness journey or something. You know, I, I originally did coaching with running, but now I just love to help people who are trying to improve with cycling. And, you know, there's a whole different range of goals they could have, but I love helping any any athlete. So in terms of your training that you're doing now, um, are you getting much training done at home while you're here? Yeah, I've actually had a really good training block since I've been back uh originally I was doing the Cycling Ireland Zwift League uh so I was kind of racing every Saturday and I was I I mean it's great to begin with but it really after about five weeks I just was like every Saturday going in there I was like wow I feel like I want to cry like I hate this (laughs) Because it just is so hard for an hour, but you don't have any of the camaraderie or like the buzz of being at a race. And I was just, I was really struggling with it. And I just went to my coach. I was like, look, I can't do this. Do not make me do another one of those races again. So now I'm, I've kind of started to move more back towards, yeah, just road specific stuff. And I suppose I'm doing a lot of um, 
because I was inside for so long with the 2K radius rule, um, now I suppose I'm building up that that big endurance space again. So I'm doing a lot of endurance hours at the moment and kind of uh, just under my FTP, I'm just doing a lot of work uh, in that sweet spot. Uh, and I love this kind of work. I love doing the the long hours. I love doing the long efforts. So it's really suiting me. So for the numbers nerds that are listening in, they'll want to know what your FTP is. Oh, my FTP is 242, I think. But I weigh, like, it all depends on your weight as well. So for somebody who's listening, they might be like, oh, my God, that's nothing. But I'm 53, 54 kilos. So it's a lot for me. <laughs> it's very light. So what's, what is that in, in uh, what's per kg? It is 4.5. Wow. 4.5, I think, yeah. And did so you my win- aim is to get that up as yeah. well. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, always, always getting the, the watch yeah, up. Yeah, always. Um, but did you enjoy uh, doing the, the, the Zwift races or being on Zwift? Because um, I know a lot of us have, have become addicted to the to the racing and to the, the crack and banter that you can have on the Discord app. And, you know, you're mm-hmm. chatting and you're chasing people from all over the world. Maybe it's different because it's your profession, whereas for the rest of us, it's all a bit of fun. Well, no, I do think Zwift has a place in cycling and I think it is a brilliant tool. Like I was on Zwift so much over the winter and it has it got me through lockdown because otherwise I would have gone crazy. But I just think that I reached my limit. I did so much on it and I just think it was it was just too much. I just couldn't I couldn't sustain it. And as well, like being indoors on the turbo is a lot different to being on the road. Like it's really your legs are constantly working, at least on the road. Like sometimes you have an uphill, a downhill. You can kind of, it's just more natural. Whereas on the turbo, your leg never stops moving. You're always working. Um, so it's it tires your body out a lot more as well. And I, I definitely found that. Give us a typical week's training uh, for Imogen. So this week, I, I've started into a big endurance block. I had four hours, then five hours, then three hours then four hours with some FTP work in it then three hours with some sprints uh just a lot of hours and a lot of I suppose we were doing some kind of work this week with um just like I was saying in my sweet spot but it was almost like mimicking a race where you're kind of you're in your sweet spot but then you have to get off and sprint to try and close a gap to a wheel or something like that so yeah it was it it's really I love this kind of training and I feel like it's really it translates well over into into actual racing on the road, whereas I feel like Zwift, it does sometimes, like, but it doesn't. Nothing can beat yeah. the road, really, when you think about it, the freedom of the road, the, the hills, the, the ups, yeah. the downs. I can never really push myself as hard uh, on the road yeah. unless you're going uphill as you can on Zwift, because when you're on Zwift, all you're thinking about is the person that's ahead of you trying to get air into you when there's a fan and where your water <laughs> is. Whereas when you're <laughs> yeah, on the yeah. road, you're, I suppose you're more conscious of like people, cars, uh, the, the things that can go wrong or the traffic lights or mm. whatever. Whereas when you're, yeah. when you're when you're on Zwift and it's easy just to jump on your bike, it's set up uh, on the turbo oh, absolutely yeah 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 I feel like it has a place as well if you if like it has a really good place in a training program if you have a specific um workout that you want to get done and you're thinking well I don't know what stretch of road I can do it on or you know there's so many factors that can affect it on the road like you're saying so I do think it has a place in the training program but I just I feel like myself and maybe a lot of other athletes went too in on Zwift um, and yeah, just needed to take a step back from it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about your fueling, Imogen, and, and how you fuel all the training that you're doing. Have, are you on a specific diet? Are you eating more or less now that you're in lockdown? Um, and how are you managing all of the fueling around your training? Well, that is something that I think I've always struggled with a bit. Um, I didn't really realize how much I was burning and how much I needed to refuel. Um, And it's actually something I always have to work on. Like, I always have to remind myself, oh, you're going out for four hours, like, you need to actually eat. It's something that I'm guilty of, uh, is is being a bit stupid when it comes to my refueling or my fueling on the bike. Like, when I'm racing, I'm quite good at it. If I'm racing, I'm good at being, okay, I need to take a gel now, I need to drink now, blah, blah, blah. But actually, when I'm just doing a ride, I, I kind of struggle to, yeah, I don't know, it's a real... It's a weakness of mine, definitely something that I can work on. I don't follow a specific diet during training um, or anything like that. I just eat what I want and I eat it in moderation, I suppose. Sometimes moderation, <laughs> not really. I do love chocolate. Like I, I never, I would never cut out chocolate because for me, it just keeps me sane. I, I've worked hard enough. I just feel like, why can't I enjoy it? So 
I don't follow anything specific. Diet questions are always really bad. If someone asks me about nutrition, I'm like, oh my God, I don't really know what to say because I don't follow anything special. Yeah, I just eat what I enjoy. And if I really enjoy something, I will eat it all the time. Um, and yeah, that's, that's how I am. So after a race, what's the food you want to have? Like, is it pizza or burger or pasta or what is the go-to meal when you've had a good day or a good, a good training day? Well, if I've had a good race and like, I feel like I've earned it, I'll, I'll get myself a pizza. Like, I will. I just like any food, really. I'm not really, a, I don't have anything special I go to. I just, I just like food. <laughs> See, this is what I mean. Like, I'm always, <laughs> my nutrition answer is always really bad because I never know what to say. <laughs> I'm waiting for you. Food. I'm waiting for you to say. Well, actually, I did like a ten-hour bike ride today, and I had a steak and chips for my dinner. <laughs> well, I would love that as well, but like I would literally eat anything. Like whatever is put down in front of me, I will eat it. See, my thing actually is that I'm really bad. Well, not bad at cooking. I hate cooking. I hate it. Like there's nothing I enjoy about cooking. I want it to be ready within five minutes, and if it's not, I'm annoyed. Like, so all these people, like, especially over, like, lockdown, people have been like, oh, I, I made this meal or sharing, like, recipes that they've made. I hate that. And I've actually just ordered a cookbook from, he's the guy who works with the, the British cycling team. Uh, I don't know what his name is, but on Instagram, he's the performance chef. Because I noticed, but I started following him and I was like, oh my God, these things are really easy. That's what I want. Like, I don't want to come back from a ride and have to make something that will take me longer than five minutes. Like it's, it's the worst. I hate being in the kitchen. <laughs> well, I, I have to admit, I did go on a bit of a baking frenzy there with porridge bread and um, I was oh, making um, flapjacks and uh, protein balls and things, but um, I kind of gave up. <laughs> I got sick of it. I don't actually mind yeah, but... <laughs> cooking, but it was like every Sunday I was like, oh, I need to get on Zwift. Get rid of this. Get rid of the baking. I'm getting too fat now. I need to <laughs> stop eating and start cycling. Well, so then... It's so handy. Like when we were at the start of lockdown, I definitely had the motivation like to want to make all these things but as it went on I was like no who am I kidding this isn't me like, <laughs> it's never gonna last <laughs> yeah um, exactly yeah no it's uh it, it's good so what did you take up in um in during lockdown did you learn anything new did you do anything different um, or did you just I say suppose, no yeah I kind of just said no there was a couple of things that I did around the house like I painted <laughs> The room that I train in, I painted that and I painted another room in our house that needed painting because I actually that's something else I love aside from cycling is I love interiors like that. That's something I really love looking at. And um, yeah, it's something I'm really into. Um, so that was something I did. But aside from that, I just said no. I just said no. <laughs> I felt like I was doing enough like with with uh, training and everything. And maybe I did a bit more like cross training like stuff that I wouldn't usually do like I did more strength work and stuff like that and um I went out for loads of walks like I was walking the whole time but now I feel like yeah I'm just chilling what's it like being home it. with the family uh your boyfriend is in Belgium you haven't seen him since March 17th or before yeah. uh, so what's it like being at home after being away for so long well I love it I am really close with my little sister and my little sister is home now because she is a she's a secondary school teacher. So obviously she's not able to work. And yeah, my mum and dad as well. Like I don't ever get this kind of prolonged period of being with them. So it's so nice. I just love it. And I love Ireland. I really do. Like it's it, Ireland is always home for me. Like even though I am in Belgium, like Ireland is always home. And were your family sporty? I know you mentioned your dad had a bike when you were started doing triathlon. Are your family yeah. sporty generally? Would you have grown up in, in a house full of sport already? Or was this a new pasture for you to kind of go off in that direction? Well, we were always very active. I wouldn't say we, like, maybe I've been more competitive than, than my other family members. But we've always been very active, like, with running and, and swimming. We were doing that since we were, you know, eight years old or seven years old or something so we've always been active and my mom when we were younger she was always running and now she does loads of walking and pilates so she's really fit and my dad is always cycling so it hasn't been weird for me to to be going out on my bike and training all the time but I think the the only thing that's different with me is that I am competitive whereas they are doing leisure it to enjoy it yeah 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 exactly, and yeah. do they come to Belgium to watch you race my dad has been over um he came over 
for the first race of this season. So at the beginning of March, he was over. My other family members, like my, I have two sisters and my mom, they haven't been over yet just because uh, myself and my boyfriend, we, we were living with his parents and we just moved into our own house. So yeah, they haven't been over yet because the house is still quite new and not finished yet. So moving to Belgium, is there a language barrier? Is it difficult or do most people speak English or have you started to learn a bit of the, the local lingo? When I moved there, I had nothing. Like, I didn't even know how to say please or thank you in Dutch. I moved there really quickly. Like, I just was like, one day I just thought, yeah, I'm going to move to Belgium. So that was really difficult. Like, when I think back to me being there at the beginning, it was so hard um, because I moved there and I didn't really think about it, I don't think, before I went. But I moved there and I I got a job working in, like, a factory um, just so I could fund myself. And it was like nobody there would speak to me in English Uh, And that was so hard. I remember like if I wanted to say something to my boss, I'd have to type it into Google Translate and then be like, uh, you know, is it time for lunch? You know, that kind of those things. I just didn't know how to say anything. And that was so hard. Like I think back on that and I think, what a lunatic. How did I move there? Like just insane. Um, But now now I can understand so much and I can speak it. I suppose with speaking, I'm not as comfortable, but I understand nearly everything. And if I'm watching TV, I can understand what they're saying. And if I'm reading it, I can understand it. So I have, you know, when I think back to where I was two years ago versus now, like, I think, thank God I, I stuck at it. And because it was just crazy when I first moved there, I just and everybody there does speak English. It was just the factory I was in. Um, I think, yeah, it's just in kind of the countryside in in Belgium so it wasn't maybe as you know if, say if I was in Brussels or Antwerp people would have no problem speaking English but they didn't they didn't want to speak it there so that was hard but everybody around me and everybody in my team at the time did speak English so that was thank god I had that but it was really tough definitely. and did you teach them any Irish no I didn't actually no I felt like there was too much going on with like <laughs> English and Dutch I was like I can't bring Irish into the mix that would really confuse things I spoke it to my boyfriend like before and he just thought he was like what are you saying he said it sounded like the Lord of the Rings like that (laughs) elvish thing so (laughs) so I didn't do that for long (laughs) but actually I did grow up like in in my home house my dad has always spoken to me in Irish so like since I was a baby living in London, my dad has spoken to me in Irish. So I, I'm fluent in Irish and I went to a Gwerkolosha as well. But yeah, I kind of now being over in Belgium with the Dutch and everything, I don't know what it is. But for me, now that I have the, all those languages in my head, like Dutch and English and Irish, sometimes I'm kind of picking like mixing things up from different languages and yeah it does get a bit confusing anyway just as well we didn't do this interview in Irish or we could have had some Dutch in it as well (laughs) or German (laughs) probably (laughs) don't know what could come out the one the one word I try try and teach everybody is this is slauncha oh yeah they're they're really important thank you and cheers so what does the future look like Imogen for you now uh, when we do get back to racing what is the ultimate goal so I've just been told yesterday by my Belgian team that the racing will kick off again in Belgium on the 1st of July, but the field will be limited to 50 riders. And yeah, as I was saying to you before we came on, like the races have been given the go ahead to go back to, to go ahead, but um, the races have been given the go ahead to go ahead, obviously. <laughs> um, but the races have the green light anyway to go ahead, um, but they have all been cancelled. So they're allowed to go ahead, but there aren't any on. So I don't really know what's going to happen with that. I suppose it's really uncertain. So for me, the ultimate goal, I don't really know what I can have as a goal. That's been a really hard part of um, of the whole lockdown and the quarantine and, and COVID and everything is kind of not knowing what I can work towards. I'm so used to having a week by week something to, to go towards. And I suppose I've been able to break things down slightly in in lockdown to kind of have smaller goals to tick off each week like say this week you know with my endurance week I was just like okay get to the end of this week nail this ride blah 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 and that was a goal I could have but it's hard to have a performance related goal because I don't really know if if I will have a chance to perform um there's a there's a calendar that uh, a UCI calendar with races that will go ahead at the you know in September October November but then again, it's kind of making selection for those. And, you know, 
it's just it, it's hard to know what to aim towards actually and are you a good athlete do you do what you're told from the coach or do you question what they ask you to do oh I do uh, it's like the bible if it's written down I, I'm doing it like I am really I'm really good at training that's yeah that's something I'm quite good at I can just get it done and what do you enjoy so much about the training I love the discipline of every day having something to do and it makes me really feel like I've achieved something and it might sound a bit dramatic or cheesy but like it gives my life meaning and I just love it that does sound really dramatic but what I mean is like it makes me feel like this is my purpose like this is what I'm doing this for um so yeah, yeah it's, it's funny you mentioned the word purpose because we had Gavin Hennigan on the show there a couple of weeks ago um, and he talks about how the adventure sports and endurance sports gives him purpose and everybody needs a purpose in life no matter what mm. it is so you know it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that and, and that you've I suppose every day when you tick off the box or you see the training peaks that it's gone green you know you've achieved something on that day so even though you're at home and you might be able to do x y and z you can control getting the green box on your training peaks by completing your session properly yeah yeah absolutely that's it I think it's just having the control and the yeah the the drive to get it done as well it's never been an issue for me I've always just if I have a training program I just get it done and if you could race with any team in the world what would it be or can you even say with that uh, scupper plans for the future (laughs) well god like dream team yeah it used to be lotto I used to because actually lotto was the first team that I ever like it was I think because I had seen um I had just seen it online so it was the first ladies team that I knew existed and I was like oh that's something I can do and I didn't really know that before but now that I'm in cycling more I'm racing with girls from Lotto in the peloton I think that now you know long term gosh I mean I, I feel always stupid saying it but there's so many teams with with riders that I admire and that I love like I always look at the Trek Segafredo team and the Canyon Shram team and I just think like yeah it looks like a really good atmosphere it looks like they motivate each other they get the work done um yeah I love looking at the girls I follow a lot of them on on Instagram like the girls from Canyon Shram and I feel like that looks like a really nice nice team and I set up and you did get into the semi-finals of the or was it the finals of the Zwift Academy yeah no I was in the the semi-finals of the Zwift Academy so that was uh I could have been on Canyon Tram but (laughs) that was last uh August September into October then with the semi-finals and yeah it was that was really tough like the the workouts were really hard but actually it gave me a lot of confidence to get through to that round uh, to get through to the semi-finals it was like oh wow wasn't there nine thousand female riders applied and went through the process and then only 10 yeah. selected to go through to the semi-finals yeah yeah so it was kind of uh it was crazy um I really couldn't believe that I was selected to go through it was obviously something I was thinking I like, because it was around the time I'd broken my arm so I was thinking oh maybe maybe now that I I had all of this fitness to use in racing. I can just use it on Zwift. So that's what I did. Um, so it really gave me such a goal during that time as well. It, it really helped me stay motivated. They're really tough workouts. So I fought hard to get through to that semi-final. Talk to me about your bikes. So I have one bike. I have a Cipollini. Uh, it's an NK, 1K. So it's like their um, 10 year anniversary edition. So it is amazing. And I had ridden I had ridden really good bikes before this, but actually once I got the Cipollini, I was like, oh my God. I have Dura Ace on it. Um, and I also have a Dura Ace power meter. I have disc brakes. Um, I have fast forward wheels waiting for me in Belgium. And yeah, the bike is just an absolute machine. Before I got it, I was reading the uh, I was reading reviews of it online and people were saying that like their average for their routes went up like by one or two K. Uh, per hour because the bike is just so fast and it's just amazing it is such a nice bike now I know you tuned in to my Facebook live with Hillary Hughes and you'll see and have heard that Hillary has names for her bikes uh, and so do I so (laughs) have you a name for your beautiful bicycle (laughs) no I don't I've seen that with Hillary and uh, as well Maura um, Maura Bella yeah Maura Claffey and Emma Porter as well (laughs) Yeah. No, I, I definitely don't. Like, I don't even know what I'd name it. Like, I'll think about it. I'll maybe that's, that yeah, one. maybe we'll ask the listeners to submit their, their answers for what you should call your bike. What colour is it? It's like a 
it's carbon fiber um so you can see like the woven carbon fiber through it but then the kind of top coat on it is a it's like a special uh reflective kind of iridescent top coat so something a bit funky I suppose it has to be a bit sparkly a bit out there <laughs> probably um you mentioned um following the other girls on on Instagram and I noticed yourself that you have quite a huge following on Instagram as well you know how do you manage that along with your training and your racing because having such a big following on Instagram and, and a social presence is a lot of work as well and maintaining that is a lot of work and being there to I suppose communicate and to converse with those that want to talk to you it, it probably takes up quite a lot of time yeah it does take a lot of time with I mean I get so many messages it's really hard to kind of uh, stay on top of that uh, but actually the posting and you know responding to comments and stuff that that's quite easy for me because I'm out riding my bike anyway taking a picture takes you know a couple of minutes maybe and if I'm racing there's always like photographers there so they'll send me a photo and then I can post it and the posting and stuff like that doesn't take a lot for me because I don't ever I just say what what actually happened or what I did on my training ride or what happened in the race you know it's uh it's quite easy to do that part of it but yeah I could definitely I mean it's the dms that that's the hard part because there's just so many that come in it's hard to keep on top of things um but yeah, I love it actually. Like it's been really great for me to have that community on there and to, you know, I've learned a lot from it and I've people are so supportive and lovely and so much has so much has come out of it for me. Like having social media, I know a lot of people say like, oh, it's a distraction or, you know, athletes should be focused on what they're doing and, you know, people see the negative side of it, but I would not be where I am today in the sport without that like without having my Instagram account you know I would not be able to do any of the things I'm doing I wouldn't be able to have my bike I wouldn't have helmets shoes like these things are so expensive and especially when you're trying to make it in cycling it's just money you don't have it's minding all of those relationships then as well with sponsors and things like that obviously takes up quite a bit of time as well. Important to, I suppose, cultivate that uh, following that you have and to mind them because they are hmm. supporting your career. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I know the people that are following me. It's amazing. Like what I, the opportunities I've had come from my Instagram and so many people see it as negative and I just don't see that negative side of it. I have barely had any negative hate comments or anything like that. I've barely had anything come negatively from it. I've had so many opportunities with different brands that I don't think I'd ever have had the chance to work with if it hadn't been for that. So yeah, I'm, I'm forever grateful for my Instagram. <laughs> And also with such a big following on Instagram, you're also a role model for other girls that are looking to come through the sport. And I know you're you're still very young at, at 26, but for young girls or even for older girls who are looking to get into cycling or to take up the sport, what would be your key pieces of advice to them if they ne- haven't touched a bike in, say, 10 or 15 years? I suppose my first thing would be to not go all in and think you have to get the most expensive bike that is out there. I feel like for me anyway, I began on just secondhand bikes from Dundeal and they were maybe 500 euro or something like that. And I think that that's important because you need to make sure that you like the sport. So I, I do think you don't have to jump right in at the deep end and make sure you like the sport, make sure it's something for you. I think finding a group that you can ride with is also really important. So, you know, that when you're riding by yourself, it's it's lovely and everything. But actually the social aspect of being with a group and stopping for a coffee, stopping for a cake, that is that is what makes cycling and it makes it so brilliant. So, yeah, that there are two kind of bits of advice that I think are quite important. Um, and then I suppose it depends on what your end goal is. If you just want to enjoy it, then enjoy it. But if you wanted to start racing, then, you know, there's a lot of things you can do if you want to start racing you know, look for a coach or, you know, get a bike fit. There's so many things that come with different goals, but they're the kind of two main pieces of advice, I would say. Don't go crazy in on a bike with loads and loads of money and try to find a nice group you can ride with. And if you look back over your career to date, is there anything you wish you'd done differently? It's funny that you asked that because actually this week when I've been on the bike, I've been thinking a lot like about when I first started cycling and, and where I am now. And I was just thinking, like, thank God I didn't give up. 
So there's nothing I'd change. There's nothing I would do differently or no, but there's everything taught me something. That's how I feel anyway. So yeah, um, nothing I'd change actually, which is quite nice to be able to say that. So other than seeing your boyfriend and getting back to racing out of lockdown, uh, what are you most looking forward to when we're allowed to freely move again and you're allowed to go back to Belgium? Well, before I go back to Belgium, I want to go for a swim here. I love getting into the sea and I've really, like, I'm in Clare, so I'm quite close to it, but I've just missed being able to just drive up to the coast and jump in. So definitely want to get a few swims in before I go back to Belgium. And then when I get back to Belgium, our, we have our little dog there. Me and my boyfriend have a little uh, a little dachshund. So can't wait to see my little dog. And yeah, I suppose as well, another thing is the roads in Belgium are really good because there's so much cycling there. So I'm looking forward to not being like constantly like shaking on my bike. <laughs> And hopefully, that's what we'll, it's like here. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get a few more cycle lanes around the cities and, and countries because there's so many people on their bikes. I don't know if you've seen it in Clare, but definitely we're just a few minutes yeah. here from Salt Hill and everyone is cycling everywhere. It's it's amazing to see and it, it's a welcome to see as well. Uh, maybe not yeah. for some of the motorists, but definitely for those of us that want to see more people cycling and, and want to be cycling ourselves. It's great to see the numbers of bike and people on bikes in the in the city and the county. Yeah, definitely. I've seen loads of uh, young people out cycling, actually. Just, you know, if they're going to a lake or something like that, I've seen I've seen loads of young people on it. So, yeah, if it if it continues, yeah, it's brilliant. Well, that's for sure. And one final question. Um, so I mentioned that you're quite a role model for younger cyclists to look up to in terms of what you've achieved so far and, and how you've taken the the big step to pursue your passion for cycling. But who inspires you? Who inspires me? I get a lot of inspiration, not so much from like big, big names. I really get inspired by people who I might ride with or, you know, who I've competed against and who are just kind of going out and getting after it every day. I find that really motivating and really um, inspiring as well. Like there's a lot of girls that I'd ride against in Belgium who are just absolute machines. So they'd really inspire me. Uh, and I find, you know, watching their training and watching how hard they work for everything, I find that really inspiring. And then closer to home, there's so many girls, like the girls I was on the, the Team Pursuit uh, set up with. When I think of like the work ethic and the the amount of work they put into it, that I find that really motivating. And uh, yeah, there's, there's so many people. Um, I, I never, I, I don't really focus on people who I don't know to inspire me I prefer to get inspired by somebody closer to home that I actually know and that I see doing the work I I prefer to get inspiration from that I think that's very valid as well because you can identify with the people that you that you know in a way do you know that kind yeah. of way like sometimes when you look at the superstars it's like oh my god I could never be like them yes I can aspire to it but I could never reach their level whereas when you look more local or closer to home mm -hmm. you can almost see yourself it's a bit like the I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the 20 by 20 campaign uh, yeah. here in Ireland you know the can't see can't be um, and I think it's mm -hmm. a hugely positive thing for us to do to provide a platform for our local heroes and the heroes that we know to have a, a wider platform to shoot from. Yeah, definitely. And I think that it kind of makes things seem more achievable as well. You know, if you like you're saying, if you look at the world champ and then think that's what I want to be, that's who I get inspired from. I think it's hard to kind of think that can be me, though. Whereas, you know, if you like you're saying, you look closer to home there are achievable goals you can take to reach the level of people around you. And there's nothing to stop you being the world champ either. It just is a couple of steps to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a few years. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Imogen, for joining me today on your rest day. I hope you get to enjoy the lovely sunny weather. I see the sun has come out yeah. here in Galway. Brilliant. And I uh, hope you enjoy your swim. And thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget you can get in touch with any feedback or guest suggestions by emailing me on trytalkingsport at gmail.com. That's try with an I, not a Y. Connect with me on social media across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. Pop by and say hi and let me know what you think of the show. If you are new to Try Talking Sport, please do check out some of our previous episodes. You will be both impressed and inspired by our guests. Until next time, wash your hands, stay safe and thanks for tuning in.